I want to thank all of you for being here today and uh, for participating in this uh, in very important conference. As a Federal Reserve Bank president and policymaker, I can't emphasize enough uh, how valuable your efforts are in helping uh, to improve the conditions in our communities throughout this country. And I support your efforts wholeheartedly. And I'm also very delighted to see our publication, the, um, uh, the REO publication, that so many of you in this room have contributed to. You know, this conference and uh, the REO publication are just, you know, an example of the commitment and the work that the Federal Reserve System has been involved with. And th the leadership from this work, uh, for this work, comes from the very top of our organization. I can tell you that our chairman, Ben Bernanke, and Governor Betsy Duke, especially, have been so committed and engaged in these efforts. And I'm also um, so pleased that we have, uh, to support their efforts and our efforts, a very talented and dedicated staff here at the board, uh, led by Sandy Bronstein. And they, and I know all of you know this so well in this room, I mean, they have a passion for this work um, that is, is just uh, tremendous. And that passion also um, is spread throughout the Federal Reserve System. And we have had you know, so much focus and, and effort in, in this area. So I'm pleased that, that we're having this conference and I'm pleased today that we're gonna be talking about some of the solutions that our work, our research efforts um, have, have come up with. And this morning, Eric and I are going to highlight different experiences that we've had from our two Federal Reserve districts. And, but even though our experiences are different, I can tell you that we both, our banks have been working very hard to deal with the pressing issues of REO and vacant properties. And in Cleveland, I'm very fortunate to have a staff, um, as Alicia mentioned, that has, um, has been you know, very engaged in, in these efforts. Uh, for long before this crisis began. And uh, we've been very fortunate, I've been very fortunate to have uh, our community affairs efforts led by Ruth Clevenger, who is here today and was uh, moderating a panel yesterday. Um, you know, her, through her staff, very dedicated and strong staff, um, you know, we, we have been able to hit the road running as this crisis unfolded, because as, as has been said, we've, we've been engaged in our, our efforts for some time, and I'll comment about that. Uh, and our staffs have been using a variety of tools to address the current needs and, you know, to assist our communities to the greatest extent possible. And while the, the reserve banks have limited authority in this area, you know, we have been actively researching these issues. And we're also using our capacity as convener, conveners to, you know, foster collaboration among lenders, property owners, public officials, and community groups. Uh, and, you know, as I said, we've been engaged in this, the system has been engaged in these efforts for a, a long time, but we've brought a great deal of focus to these efforts in the past couple of, of years. Charlie Evans mentioned uh, that last night in his comments. And, you know, an, a, some examples of that is that, you know, the Federal Reserve's Community Affairs Function sponsored or co-sponsored more than 280 foreclosure-related events across the country over the past couple of years. And by the end of this year, uh, we will have sponsored five national conferences on housing and mortgage markets, financial literacy and education, neighborhood stabilization, and mortgage policy. Yesterday, uh, Governor Betsy Duke spoke eloquently about some of the problems that uh, we're facing in Cleveland, as well as some of the efforts that we've undertaken to deal with them. And this morning, I'm gonna give you a, a fourth district perspective. Uh, and um, as you know, I think many of you know, the fourth district includes all of Ohio, the western half of Pennsylvania, the eastern half of Kentuck Kentucky, and the panhandle of West Virginia. And the REO problems in the communities within that district are very severe. And the resources, as you can imagine, during these tough economic times are quite limited. But the need for assistance is, is strong and immediate. 
So this morning I'm going to give, explain some of the weaknesses that we face in our area, in our region, but also talk about some of the strengths that we found in, in our district. And then I'm going to talk about some of the ideas that have emerged from our bank's research efforts and outreach efforts related to the housing crisis. And then finally I'll describe a new proposal to use the Community Reinvestment Act's flexibility uh, to channel more resources to the REO problem. So let me begin with the weaknesses that we face uh, in the district and some of the strengths that we've found. Uh, one major weakness, and, and I, I know this is pretty obvious to, to everyone at this point, is that our district is, is a weak market region. And when I say weak market, I'm referring to just the long-term uh, loss of overall population, as well as migration uh, within our region to areas outside of our central cities. In Cuyahoga County, where Cleveland is located, we lost 7% of our population from the period of 2001 to 2009. Between that same period, 2001 to 2009, total private employment in Cuyahoga County fell by 14%. And we, we struggle uh, tremendously with very stubbornly high unemployment rates. So these weak market trends left a serious excess of housing in our region well before the housing crisis got underway nationally. In some parts of Ohio, housing sales began to weaken as early as 2004. So simply put, Ohio's problems are, are, more, entr are more entrenched because they're tied to structural weakness in our economy, not just cyclical weakness. And as the population declines and job losses increase, a major byproduct, of course, is vacancies in residential and commercial properties. And of course, the housing and foreclosure crisis made this problem that already existed much worse. And I'm sure that many of you have heard that you know, Cleveland has been described as the epicenter of the foreclosure crisis. In the city of Cleveland alone, the average number of days that properties sit vacant has skyrocketed from 114 days in 2006 to 954 days in 2010. Of course, you know, the longer the, a property remains vacant, the more collateral damage is done to the property values nearby, and it doesn't take long for neighborhoods to suffer from increased crime, arson, and blight. And so we're still very far from a recovery in the housing market in our region. The losses and, and the hardships in our neighborhoods that um, they've been experiences, experiencing is just staggering. And in many low-income communities, decades of progress that we were making prior to this crisis it has just been wiped away. Fortunately, we found that in our region we also have some real strengths, and those strengths are helping to combat some of these weaknesses that we're seeing. We're blessed uh, with a collaborative and sophisticated community development culture. Our local elected officials, our community-based organizations, and our financial institutions have been working together effectively for years. As I said earlier, our crisis, our housing crisis, started long before the national housing crisis, and so in some ways that got us um, more ready to work together to address some of these issues than in other parts of the country. These groups have shared a wealth of experience and long-standing partnerships and a solid commitment to community reinvestment. And so they've been able to, to achieve some real results, even in these very, very challenging and tough times. For example, um, in recent years, the city of Cleveland has negotiated a large number of lending commitments and investments with uh, designate, designated uh, depository banks through its community reinvestment initiative agreements. Uh, CRA investments have brought creative reuse of land in our urban neighborhoods. You know, one example of that one outcome uh, is a new what, what's called the new uh, renaissance at Fair, Fairfax Park. It's a six million dollar multifamily building project that uh, has high quality apartments for seniors and you know this project sprang up, sprang up from a, a formerly blighted area in, in that community. 
also uh, what was once a steel manufacturing plant uh, in Cleveland has been transformed into what's now called Steelyard Commons. And it's a million square foot shopping center that has brought not only uh, a much more attractive uh, structure in that area, but it's brought new jobs because it's brought uh, real retail jobs and also um, many services to the, to the residents in, in that uh, area. Another example, the Cuyahoga County Land Bank that was formed last year by partnerships among county offices, the city of Cleveland, suburban officials, and again, the community development corporations is another example of collab the collaboration that has brought tremendous results. Through the land bank, the county has, uh, can reclaim vacant and abandoned properties for a productive reuse. The land bank acquires and manages these properties by working with a number of partners th uh, through agreements with GSEs and financial institutions that hold foreclosed properties and um, also in partnership with individual partner, uh, part, uh, property owners and nonprofit organizations. And this land bank is the lead agency in implementing four, $40 million in neighborhood stabilization program funds along with partners in Cuyahoga County, the City of Cleveland, and the Cuyahoga Metropolitan Housing Authority. And you can read more about this land bank in the REO publication uh, that was released yesterday. There's an article in that publication by Tom Fitzpatrick from our bank. And uh, it's, uh, I hope, I mean, it's an informative article, and I hope that um, you find it informative also. Of course, you know, despite these successes that I'm uh, pointing to, there's just a tremendous amount of work that remains in our hard-hit communities in Ohio. So now I'd like to discuss some of the ideas that have emerged from our bank's research and outreach efforts related to the housing crisis. You know, like at many of the other reserve banks, at our bank it's been all hands on deck uh, dealing with this issue. It's not just been our community affairs department that's been out there working on this issue. Uh, as, as Charlie mentioned yesterday, our research departments uh, have been engaged in this along with our supervision staff. You know, with a problem of the size and complexity that we face, it became pretty clear that, you know, there wasn't going to be a, a one solution fits all. It was going to take multiple uh, efforts and multiple solutions uh, to come up with solutions to this, uh, this crisis. And our research effort has led us to understand that the housing market collapse, you know, is again, some of this is obvious to so many of you in this room, but it's, it's a destructive cycle. You know, in our region, mortgage delinquencies led to a higher number of foreclosures, which led to an oversupply of housing, which then led to home prices depreciating and borrowers and financial institutions taking on big losses. You know, to, t to break this cycle, it was clear that it was, we were going to have to have a coordinated set of policies. And it was going to, these policies were going to have to deal and address many points of breakdown in this process. And we also realized that as we were rolling out some of the policies, that we were going to have to make sure that they were helping in an intended way. Because as we've seen, some policies just weren't as effective and weren't working in the way they were intended. So each time we found that some of, the, some of these policies and efforts weren't working, it, it was important for us to step back and um, address and bring new ideas to the table. And you've all been very supportive and helpful in making that happen. You know, in, and one example of that is that in the early stages of this housing crisis, researchers thought that loan modification would be the, the appropriate answer to address the, the, the situation. But unfortunately, after conducting a series of public events, we found that only a small, a very small percentage of distressed loans have been modified successfully. And I know you talked about that yesterday. And we found, obviously, that some of the failure was due to loan servicers operating with a business model that just uh, wasn't designed to address the immediate needs of troubled borrowers. So in recent month, months, we've discovered that, obviously, the main reason that people are finding themselves in foreclosure is and needing assistance is a, a result of loss of income due to, to the economic crisis that we're in. So the loan modification program just wasn't, alone wasn't enough to address the housing crisis. 
over the past couple of years, our research at the Cleveland Federal Reserve Bank led us to then focus in on two areas that we thought would be more promising in addressing some of the issues that we face in our region. And those two areas are the Neighborhood Stabilization Program and the Community Reinvestment Act. Now, uh, we, uh, you obviously talked about the NSPC yesterday, and you're well aware of the reason that it was put in place. It was to help communities acquire distressed properties and put them back to productive use. And we learned a lot about NSPC, the NSP uh, program when our bank partnered with the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond and conducted a series of case studies in our different communities that were receiving the NSP funds. And we conducted a lot of outreach with stakeholders in our region and learning to learn more about what was working and what wasn't working. And our goal was to find ways to which uh, so that the NSPC, NSP program could be used more effectively to address the problems in our neighborhoods. And we shared what we learned, what the uh, Richmond Fed and the Cleveland Fed learned with, uh, the, with the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And I commend HUD in its responsiveness in using the information that we shared with them to make the changes that uh, communities needed to the NSP program. And the changes that they've made, I think, are going to make the program much more effective because uh, of, of the changes that they were willing to make uh, from our suggestions. You know, looking ahead, it's clear that even more needs to be done to take advantage of the NSP program. You know, our case studies and research found that there needs to be a lot of upfront comprehensive planning. It can't just be a, a one-time um, this is a one-time look at this and, and, and address the problem. It really does take a lot of comprehensive planning. And we heard that yesterday from the practitioners and our panelists, that the, where these funds are being most effective is where there is a comprehensive long-term plan for the use of these funds. And in our outreach uh, effort, we have, uh, again, seen that that's where these NSP uh, funds are most effective. That community leaders have to look outside of the traditional ways that they might approach uh, programs like this or funding like this, and, and that's what we found uh, is the case. NSP is a great tool, but communities obviously can't take advantage of this tool and the money without first being able to identify who owns the distressed properties and then acquiring them uh, with uh, clear titles to them. And community groups would like to acquire distressed, distressed properties for reuse, you know, either as for new rehab um, housing or for green space. But it takes time to track down the owners and then the servicers to make that happen. And neighborhood recovery efforts just can't uh, go forward and they suffer you know, as properties are sold in bulk to out-of-town investors, many of whom are flippers. And even if community groups can acquire these vacant properties in time, the community often needs additional resources, obviously, to rehab the properties and to pay delinquent taxes. The community groups who've engaged with our bank uh, in conversations about how do you make that happen uh, over the last two years, we found through those conversations that one potential way of, of uh, hope addressing some of these problems is to use the CRA. And uh, using CRA as an incentive for uh, financial institutions to maintain REO properties and then to sell it uh, to, to responsible investors. However, when we talked about using the CRA, it wasn't immediately obvious how we could do this. You know, after all, bankers and community leaders and academics alike, you know, told us that in the age of internet banking, you know, the CRA rules are just insu insufficient. We all know that our history with CRA has been that CRA credits get awarded to uh, banks that focus on neighborhoods where they have a branch pr uh, pr presence, but that it's clear in a situation in an environment like today you know, banks might be owning distressed properties outside of their CRA assessment areas. So in addition, we also learned that credit needs w through the CRA, or well, that the CRA was meant 
to advanced credit to low and moderate income properties so that mortgages and new homes, I mean homes could be purchased. And what we found though in this situation, the best way to serve these low and moderate income neighborhoods was to help them acquire and tear down properties, not necessarily to advance more credit uh, to own new property. So fortunately we learned as we did more work that the CRA does have enough flexibility, the, the act and the way it was written does have enough flexibility so that we could use it in some more creative ways. And our research staff and community affairs staff put together, put their heads together and came up with a proposal to use CRA um, through not having to revise the act, but to um, revise some of the regulations around CRA. And through some of that thinking, it has led to a CRA proposal by the four regulatory agencies. Uh, the comment period for that proposal has just ended. And I think that uh, through this proposal, I think we're gonna have some good outcomes. Uh, we first, we suggested that giving banks more CRA credit if they would shift some of their resources that they usually devote to CRA activities uh, where they have branches to areas where REO dispositions um, in, the, in the nation's weakest markets so that they could be, be put focusing their CRA efforts there. And they don't have to have a physical presence in those markets. And so that was the first suggestion. And the second suggestion is that we, um, we said that banks should be able to claim CRA credit for acquiring and tear, tearing down uh, rehabbed and distressed properties. And I'm very pleased, again, that the recent CRA rule changes proposed by the four regulatory agencies are very close in spirit to, to our proposals. I think the proposed changes uh, would amend the, the CRA regulations to, to more support those communities that have these high foreclosure issues. So the interagency proposal, I think, uh, is going to be, is consistent with some of the work that our bank staff has done and the work that we've been hearing through our outreach efforts with so many of you. But you know, it's clear that the CRA is just one tool. And we, as so many of you have said throughout the day yesterday, and I'm sure we'll hear today, it's gonna to require numerous interventions if we're gonna really address uh, the concerns and, and, and the magnitude of, of this foreclosure crisis. And I know I speak for all of us in the Federal Reserve System when I say that you know, we feel a great sense of urgency in getting the housing market back on its feet. We indeed know that a healthy housing sector is so critical for the overall economy and for a sustainable economic recovery. The Federal Reserve System, as you know so well, is a decentralized structure, and it's the, the decentralized structure that we have has been so helpful in, it's been helpful obviously throughout our history, but it's been extremely helpful to us during this housing crisis because it gives us on the ground people throughout the country to work with so many of, of the community groups, so many of you. And, and through that outreach, again, we've, we've been able to come up with numerous ideas and solutions that we're, we're, we will hear more about today. We're gonna continue, obviously, to help and support community leaders and policymakers throughout our research activities. And I know, you know that each of you that have taken the time to be a part of this conference to contribute to the publication that we've released on these issues, I know that uh, you are critical in the making some policy solutions to this enormous uh, task in revitalizing our housing sector a success. So I thank all of you for your hard work and your creativity and your dedication to this very important cause.